expecting an invitation from Barack Obama. And that's because I feel that America owes me something, an apology. So um, the protagonist, I mean, some of the stories that I, the stories I'm going to tell actually are stories of my own immigrant experience. Wherever I've been, the question has always arisen, is this your story? And I said, hell no, I've never stolen a god. <laughs> <laughs> So it's not my story. But I have also some interesting stories of my own to tell. So let me tell one or two of them, if you don't mind. Right? So, so before I came to this country, my uh, parents um, invited me home uh, because they felt that I needed proper preparation for this major rite of passage. I had never been outside of Africa. I'd been to a few African countries, but never outside of the continent. So this was a really huge deal that Chinua Achebe invited me to come be the founding editor of a magazine that he founded called African Commentary. So I went home, and my parents and uncles and aunts were giving me advice. An aunt of mine, a very old aunt, my father's only sister, said to me, whatever you do, don't marry a white woman. And I said, what's the problem with a white woman? And she says, oh, I love them. It's just that I want somebody, a wife whose language I, I can understand. I ended up marrying a half white woman. <laughs> but then an uncle of mine said to me, okay, whatever you do in America, make sure that when you speak to Americans, you don't make eye contact. And he said to me, every American carries a gun. <laughs> and if you look them in the eye, they will think that you are being provocative and they will shoot you. So my uncle had never been to America, so you wonder <laughs> where he formed this impression. Well, years ago, from time to time, a movie would be shown in a public space, right? And they were usually Westerns. They were usually black and white affairs with very grainy picture in which there was a gap between the movement of the lips of the characters and the sound of the voice. I don't quite know who arranged those movies, but my guess is the CIA. The CIA <laughs> wanted Nigerians and Africans to see how sexy America was, see. And so we didn't quite understand what was going on in the movies. But at some point, usually in a bar, several characters will get, get together and stare each other down. And that became a signal that they will pull guns from both sides of the hip and start shooting. And people will walk themselves into a frenzy of excitement. And we loved it when they began to knock down the bottles, you know, <laughs> with their bullets. So my uncle formed the impression that the worst crime you could commit against an American was to look them in the face. Because they would stare each other down, and that's when they pulled the gun. So he said, make sure you don't look Americans in the face. I promised not to. And so 10 days after I came to this country, and by the way, I came to this country December 10, 1988. So on December 20, I was at a bus stop in Amherst, Massachusetts, where I lived at the time, waiting for a bus that would convey me to a meeting with your friend, Professor Naji. As I waited, a police officer was driving past the bus stop, and he and I made eye contact. And I said, whoa, this guy is going to shoot me quickly. <laughs> so I made a dramatic gesture of looking away, which was a way of saying to him, I'm sorry. I looked at you inadvertently. But from the corner of my eye, I could see that he turned into a side street. And I said, good, he's gone his way. About a minute later, I got a tap on my shoulder. And I looked to my side, and I had to look to the sky, but I stopped at his chest, because this was a very tall man. And he said to me, sir, do you mind coming to the back of the bus stop? Well, those of us who are Nigerian and African will know that nobody in uniform in Nigeria will call you sir to begin with, unless they really, really are scared of you. And def definitely, they will never use differential language like, do you mind? So there was a moment of cultural disorientation. I said, wow, this man is scared of me. He's calling me sir. And I thought I had a choice. 
that I could say to him, no, I don't want to meet you. I, you know, I'm busy. Maybe I'll meet you some other time. But on second thought, I said, this man is genial, so let me make his acquaintance immediately. So I said, I don't mind. So I came to the back of the bus stop, and he folded his arms. And of course, I was looking at his chest, making sure that I never met his gaze. And he says to me, sir, you know what this is about, right? Of course, I knew what it was about. I had looked him in the eye, but I wasn't going to admit it. Because once I admitted it, he would have the right, under the Constitution of America, to shoot. <laughs> so I said, no, I don't know what it's about. He says, sir, are you sure you don't know what it's about? I said, I don't know. Well, who wants to take a guess what it was about? Oh, good. So the officer said to me, sir, there has been a bank robbery, and you fit the description. So when I tell the story, retell the story these days, I like to say to people that I began to protest that I've been in this country for only 10 days and that if I was going to rob a bank, I would need better training. <laughs> but I didn't say that to the officer. I began to stutter. And of course, making sure that I didn't look him, compound my crime by making eye contact. So finally, he said to me, sir, do you have identification? I said, no. He said, why not? I said, the only form of ID I had on me was my passport. And I didn't think it made sense to carry it wherever I went. So he said to me, do you mind if I frisk you? Even though he said, do you mind? Even though frisk was outside of my vocabulary at the time, because when my friends were reading James Hadley Chase, <laughs> an American novel, well, it's actually not American. I think it's some British guy who was writing those things, you know, uh, which a lot of my high school friends were consuming. Somehow I fell in love with African literature, which my friends thought was Bush. So they wanted to read, you know, what they felt was urbane and sophisticated literature. So they read James Harley Chase. So it was a shock for me when I came to America. And I would say to Americans, James Harley Chase, and they'd never heard ab about <laughs> such a writer. <laughs> So, I didn't know what frisk meant, but I said, no, I don't mind. Frisk might, could have meant, do you mind if I shoot you? And I said, <laughs> I didn't mind. So he asked me to throw my hands up, and I did, and he began to pat me down. Convinced now that I had no weapons of mass or single destruction, <laughs> he said to me, do you mind if I drive you to your apartment because I'd like to see your passport? I said, I didn't mind. But again, those of us who are Nigerian know that the police occasionally, or perhaps more than occasionally, engages in extrajudicial something. So I said, perhaps this guy wants to trick me to some untidy corner and shoot me. So I began to weigh my options. Should I make a dash for it and risk being shot from behind? Should I begin to shriek? so that some people will come to my aid, or should I be compliant and perhaps with some luck have the officer let me be? So I decided to take the last option. So he put me in the back of the cruiser and radioed headquarters and said he picked up a suspect who had no identification. So he arrived in my house, and Chinua Achebe's two younger children, Ch uh, Wando and Chidi, who are spending their Christmas vacation with me. So I said to them in Igbo, I've been arrested for bank robbery. <laughs> <laughs> then I went to my room and picked up my passport and gave it to the officer. And he began to look through it and began to punch some uh, on a machine that he carried. Well, after a while, this sufficed to uh, assure him that I wasn't the person they were looking for. So he handed me back my passport and said to me, thanks for being a gentleman. And I was about to make a run for it, but I said to him, sir, do you mind? Because it occurred to me that so many people saw him pick me up. And in my mind, I said, there's going to be a narrative in town that people will see me walking around and point to me and say, this guy is some kind of criminal. We don't have the details. You know, that's how stories grow, right? 
he's some kind of criminal. We saw him arrested by the police. We don't quite know what he did, right? So I said, maybe if I could persuade him to drop me back at the bus stop, <laughs> there'll be other people who see him drop me so that there'll be two narratives in town. Some people will say the police arrested him. Other people will say, we saw the police drop him off at the bus stop. <laughs> so I said to him, do you mind dropping me at the bus stop? He said he didn't mind. So he dropped me, and I took a, a bus to UMass, but I was terribly late for the meeting. So Professor Nigel was not in his office, and I waited, and waited for about an hour. And he finally came in, and he saw me, and he was in shock. He said, OK, how did you get here? I said, I've been here for more than an hour. What happened was I neglected to tell the Achebe children that I've been freed. <laughs> so they called him and said, OK, he's been picked up for bank, bank robbery. And so he got in his car and ran to the police station. And the police said, there is no such guy in our, uh, pos in our possession. And so he went to two other towns, South Hadley and so on, and asked, and they said they didn't have me. And he came back to Amherst police and asked again, and they said, no, he's not here. And he called the Achebes and said, are you sure that an Amherst police officer had him? They said, yeah, it's Amherst police was clearly written on the cruiser. So he told the police that he was going to go call an attorney. Well, he walked in and I've been there all this while. So that's why I've been expecting an invitation to beer, to have a beer <laughs> at the White House. 